Hello, sports card fans. This is Joe. We've got baseball cards. And today I'm very excited to welcome a longtime friend to the Got Baseball Cards channel, Mr. Dennis Warden. Dennis, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Joe. Thanks for having me on. Sure thing. Uh, Dennis owns Triple Play Sports Cards in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. How long have you been in business now, Dennis? We opened my store um, June 1st of 2001. All right. Um, before that, I worked for two other people in the industry and before that i did card shows on the weekends all right so pretty much since 1989 i believe i've been selling cards okay so now how long have you been a collector though i bought my first pack of cards or my dad bought my first pack of cards in 1975. so about the same yeah i started 76 so about, yeah. about the same i had a few packs from 75 i somehow missed 76 and 77 and hit it hard in 78. all right yeah, I think 77, because I, I got the bug really quickly, and I remember my first first cards I was really sorting heavily were in 77, <clears throat> and then, of course, was trying to build sets by 78, 79, so forth. So, sure. Well, you and I have, have just attended, um, actually, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, tell me a little bit about your shop. I've never got to visit, always wanted to. Tell me, tell me what things are like at your shop and, and how, how it's grown over the years. Sure. Um, we have a retail store in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, like you said. Um, about 70% of our business is done in store um, locally. We also have a website on Beckett Marketplace and we have a eBay store with about a million different items. So we stay pretty busy with the retail and the online shipping and stuff. Um, it's been a great year as, as you know, um, for the sports card industry and in general and for our store. Um, Pretty exciting actually um, there's people in our store constantly and um, just a lot of excitement in the industry overall yeah and uh, and uh, I can definitely vouch for that and I can also vouch for the great service you provide because we uh, we like Dennis up with orders on eBay very often because when we if we run out of something and need it or our customer sends us want lists he is our first source that we go to. So uh, 1967 DEW on now. And I got to tell you, Dennis, I always thought a 67, is that your birth year? It is. Yep. And under my initials, you know, I got to tell you a funny story because when I used to shop before we really knew each other well, and I knew that was your initials, I always thought you must just really love Mountain Dew. So <laughs> I thought that had to be why you chose that. You know, I kind of figured, and I figured 67, maybe that was your favorite set, which, which if I'm correct, that is a set you're working on, right? Correct. That's my main collection is 1967 stuff. Um, so, so yeah, I'm very impressed, but tell me, but tell, tell our listeners about the uh, photo you sent me the other day. Cause I was really impressed with that. Oh, that was uh, um, 1967. Boston Red Sox test issue stickers that Tops did back in 1967. They did that with two teams. They did it with the Pirates and the Red Sox. Yeah. And I'm putting a set together in, in a PSA 7 grade. And there's most, most of them are about 10 to 20 issues only that are, have been graded in a 7. So they're fairly hard to find. Yeah, really. You know, I have, have 25 out of 33 so far, so I have 8 to go. That's awesome. Now tell me about your master set of 60. So you're building in what grade in the 67 baseball set? I'm doing all the 67 sets in a PSA seven. Um, so baseball one, I'm the furthest, furthest along. Um, I have about 160 to go on that one out of the 609, I believe there are. So I'm about three quarters done or getting close to it. And how, how close are you on the other sports? Um, the Philadelphia football set, there's two, there's two football sets in 67, a Tops and a Philadelphia set. The Philadelphia set, I just passed the halfway mark. Um, I'm maybe 40% done with the Tops. And the Tops hockey, I'm not very far along. They're hard to find compared to the other sports. I probably only have about 30 of those. So any of our listeners, any of our viewers who have high grade 67s, uh, especially if you've got PSA sevens, eights or higher, uh, let me know or let Dennis know and we will uh, try to complete some transactions so Dennis can get his set finished because- Yep, uh, my, my sets are only sevens though. I don't want the eights or nines for my set. Not I would take them to resell them, but for my set, it's gonna be a uniform seven across the board. Okay, gotcha. You already got the Seaver, Carew. Yep. 
yep. Coach Robinson. I have all the Hall of Famers except for three of them. I'm missing Bob Gibson, whose price just shot up because he passed away recently. Right. Um, so I'm going to have to pay more than that for that one than I would have a year ago. Um, and then Willie Stargell and one other one. I'm not thinking of it right now. And then I have most of the high numbers. So the hard part is finding the commons because people don't grade those as often as the stars. Right. So now how do you have time? I know you run an incredibly busy retail store and online. Did you actually have much time to even search for those? I don't. I spend about 10 minutes every morning or when I think of it, um, just taking quick looks on eBay to see what's out there. Okay. My, I like getting one or two at a time, though. I don't want a whole bunch because I enjoy them more that way when I just get one or two at a time because then I can actually look at them. When I get a big grouping, then some of them I don't even get really pay attention to or whatever. Right. Now, talking, now you're a set collector, uh, obviously, working on a 67 set. Do you have many, now that our, our hobby has certainly changed um, over the last 20 years that you've had your store. Um, what, what shift have you seen in the store as far as set collectors versus people who are basically, you know, just going for the big pull? What kind of balance of that do you see right now? Yeah, actually I've seen a resurgence in set collectors during um, COVID. Um, people, um, I collected in the 80s and the 90s, the, the bulk era or whatever you want to call it, junk era. Um, they went out in their basement or garage and found their sets and started completing them again. So I had a lot of people during this time come in with lists trying to complete sets. Um, and also could see on our, um, on our online orders that people were working on sets because they'd ordered 40 cards from the same set or whatever. Um, or 20 here and 20 there from the same set. So it looked like they're completing sets. Um, that being said, we we're also seeing a lot of people just coming in and opening the hot new wax, trying to hit that big Zion or Jaw or now Joe Burrow. Um, it's kind of moved from basketball to football in the last month here for our store. Right. Now, is football your number one seller year round? In a typical year, yes. Maybe basketball passed at the last two years, but football still will sell really good for us year round. Baseball sells good for a, a while during the season. It's not as big as basketball and football for us. So tell me about, of course, and, you know, I'm near, I'm 30 minutes from Atlanta. So, you know, the Atlanta teams are our hometown team. Who, who do your customers think of as their hometown? Or, you know, who, who are the closest teams that people follow? Yeah, the main teams would be Minnesota teams, the Twins, Vikings. Um, Timberwolves don't have a huge following in my area, but we're only t 12 miles from Minnesota. So that's kind of what we'd consider our home state or whatever, as far as major league teams. Right. Okay. So you, did you grow up as a twins fan? I did. Yep. I grew up in Minnesota and moved to South Dakota in 91. Okay. So of course, so you watched the twins beat our Braves. When we did. That's the year I moved here. When Herbeck lifted Gant's leg off the base and, and got that, uh, that that out, he should, never should have got. I'm sorry, I'm still just a little bitter about that one, you know. So that yeah, just for you, that bat up right up here is a Kent Herbeck bat for you. Uh, <laughs> <great>. <laughs> just for you, Joe. Uh, I've got a saw that I could put to that one if I had get my hands. <laughs> so, no, that was a great series. Just hated that the Braves couldn't have won it, but uh, it was an exciting time here. That was the. Uh, you know, during that era when the Braves went worse to first. So, yep. We just can't went, we, go ahead. So we finally got our title in 96. I mean, yep. And we haven't won a playoff game in 17 years or something. So, <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. I said 96, 95. Went back in 96 and lost it. But, yeah. So, <laughs> sorry, I'm still a little bitter about this year. The Braves should be playing in the series right now, as you know. So, uh, yeah, I was cheering for them. Can't believe they dropped three in a row to the Dodgers, but but hey, you know I like Kershaw. Maybe he'll uh, maybe he'll finally get a ring this year. So, well, tell me, we both just finished off the summit, the industry summit, the last three days. Um, got to listen to some great speakers. Got to hear from Panini and and Brian Gray at Leaf and and uh, a lot of corporates, but Mike Singletary and got a lot of great speakers, a lot of great content. So for our viewers, what are some of your takeaways? Uh, what did you learn? What are some things that you think you're going to try to apply in the business and any, anything new you learned at, at the summit? 
There's two main takeaways for me. First one, I'm excited about the Panini, um, the kids crate that they're creating. Yeah. Um, our industry needs something for kids again, um, especially with the Targets and Walmarts and those stores being cleaned out consistently. So I'm, I'm really excited about having something for the kids um, that I can sell to them and um, at a good price point. And I'm looking forward to that, I guess, was one of the main takeaways from what I learned. Um, the other thing is that, um, I can't remember who said it, you'll probably know, but they said that we're probably in only the second or third inning of this run on cards where cards are going to be hot. So we're, we're just getting going on this and we should have some good years ahead of us. Yeah, I like that. I mean, I think Brian Gray yesterday, and he, he said that he thought we may only be in the bottom of the first. So yeah, that was an encouraging to hear that from a manufacturer. Of course, we heard it from Ken Golden, who's you know one of the, the top auction houses around and, and uh, has, has sold a number of multi-million dollar cards. Um, Josh Luber at StockX and Jason Koontz. For, and so uh, their, their modern card discussion was really good to me, you know, because yep, they, the, I really enjoyed that too. Yeah, they, they had really It's really, really was encouraging to hear people like that, that see a bigger picture than what I do. I get stuck in my own little world in South Dakota here and see things are good, but they see the overall picture and more people coming into the hobby in a bigger way than I do. Right. So yeah, it was a, it was a very encouraging event. Uh, hated that we couldn't all be together. Um, so we're supposed to do it in Vegas next year. Hopefully we're going to be able to. Uh, so, um, I know we also, uh, did you sit in on the session with BGS, with Jeremy Murray? Um, yes, I, I did catch part of that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. He talked about how, how behind BGS is. And of course that's true for all the grading companies right now. Um, uh, uh, I know I talk with PSA every week with our account rep and about the situation there. And I know they're hiring new people weekly, seems like, and uh, trying to add more space because there's so much demand. What what growth have you seen in your store on the grading side of things? Well, we just started grading for customers about December, I think it was. Um, I know you encouraged me for years and it took me a while to jump on board. Um, so we're just starting to see some of those early shipments come back um, because it does take a long time. Some of them take six months or so. Right. Um, so, and then with the COVID break where they are closed for a while. So we're just starting to see some stuff come back regularly, but during this whole time, we've been sending in about a hundred cards a week for people and ourselves. And so soon we'll consistently have those cards coming back. And I'm pretty excited about that for people. Yeah. And and we're it's, happy. it's been, a, it's been a really good add-on for our store. Pe people have enjoyed being able to just drop their cards off and we take care of the paperwork and all that stuff and get their cards sent off and call and they get back. So, Yeah, and we're happy to share with our viewers for, for collectors in your area uh, who can come to you in person. Um, we're now able to, uh, Dennis is now working with us and we're to, to help get preferred turnaround times for customers and uh, so you can for those who visit our site on gotbaseballcards.com see our grading page with the, the terms and the pricing um, you can take your cards into Dennis and he will send them off for you and you can pick them up there and so we're happy to be able to to offer that and Dennis offers that uh, so he can give you on-site um, I know you have a great team that I know Mike we work with there and uh, helps customers with their grading cards and um, one of the big things that we do in our store that I know you'll do the same for customers is if they're not sure what they should grade or if something's in a good, good enough condition to grade. Um, I know y'all will do the same for customers because that's, I had a guy just this week sent us close to a hundred cards and we eliminated 28 of them. And he was just thrilled that like, wow, I didn't have to spend money on those 28 cards you know, because he thinks how much money he would have wasted. And so, you know, I know you've been in the hobby a long, long time and have great expertise. And so I just, and I know you're a believer like me that we should use that experience to help others. Right. Yeah. We probably grade less than half of what people bring in 
Um, we, we'll go through and look at the car, point out anything that we see as a flaw, what we think it'll grade. Obviously, we can't guarantee that grade, but then we let the customer decide if they want to grade it or not after that. Some people just want it graded for their own collection. They don't really care the grade. That's fine, but we'll still point out what we think might might be wrong with the card. Oh. Yeah, it's a, it's a great service and customers I know are very appreciative of it. So again, if you're in Dennis and Sioux Falls area, anywhere in that vicinity and you need somebody to look at your cards, take them by and let Dennis and Mike check them out and uh, they will provide great service for you. And so uh, as I'm encouraging customers nowadays, because it is so slow, uh, we really recommend the um, kind of the mid tier service, the, the $30 price point where you can send cards up to $500 value uh, because it is much, much faster and uh, the, the volume they're receiving is is overwhelming, I know. And uh, because, I mean, I, I, I look at them when we enter submissions, you know, and then we, you know, then the next day we enter submissions, we see how many submissions have been processed and it's just staggering the thousands of orders going in. Uh, but that just shows there is such demand for cards to be authenticated, cards to be graded, uh, autographs to be authenticated, you know, they're just all those different things that go into PSA submissions. And I know it's not just PSA, BGS, uh, as Jeremy Murray pointed out, and uh, Jeremy's a great guy, and, and, and I, uh, uh, even though we primarily use PSA, I, I uh, love the guys at BGS, and I know they, uh, much like PSA, they wish they could speed turn around up. And as Jeremy said, man, I wish I could hire, you know, uh, a handful of graders every day, but, um, I'm, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing. He just made the point that he wished they could add more and more graders to speed things up. But he said that would diminish the quality of the service. And that's the same thing PSA is going through. You know, you've got to have quality graders, not just a quantity of graders. Correct. There's lack of, people who have the experience doing it. Yeah. And then when they add somebody new, they're taking somebody that's good at it to teach that person. So it slows down a little bit before they get that person going the way I understood. Yeah. Yeah. I've been there and done that in, in, uh, on a different Avenue. I remember years ago when we were just having a crazy holiday season and I was, I literally had days where I hired new people daily to help get us through the shipping side of things. And I would have somebody that I'd hired, you know, like on a Friday and then by the next Wednesday, they were training other people. Had to, <laughs> I'm just like, something's wrong with this. I'm like, yeah. you know, that's, that's, uh, I just see problems happening from this. So, so things are a little more stable now. We've got a, a great crew, but uh, so I understand what it's like when you're ramping up and they seem like they've been ramping up all year. It never stops. Right. Uh, the volume just keeps going up and keeps going up. And uh, the more publicity their stock gets, and people hearing it, you know, it's just, and the thing is uh, talking about stock, I, I, it was an interesting point Brian Gray made. He said he had like hedge fund investors. He had people um, from the outside of our industry talking to him. And he, Brian's not the first one I've heard say this. I know uh, I've, I've heard others, other leaders, high profile people in the industry. Um, what do you think that speaks to all these outsiders coming in all the money pouring in. What what do you think that indicates? That there's a lot of interest in cards out there and they think it's gonna be good for a while or they wouldn't be looking to invest in our industry. Yeah, a, a great quote I heard somebody say um, is that, you know, peop, you know, the people with money, you know, they're not looking for art, you know, they're not buying stamps, they're not interested in coins, they want things that the pe that people relate to, you know, people don't want to walk in. I mean, this is a general rule of thumb. I'm not, I'm not dissing art collectors, uh, but as a general rule of thumb, a lot of the people, uh, the new money into the hobby is coming in because they want to own a LeBron James Chrome rookie and show it off to their buddies Yep. because their buddies would love to have one too. You know, not everybody wants a, Pic a Picasso hanging on their wall. You know, they don't relate to it but they can relate to the guy they see on TV or, or they, you know, they, they want a Jordan rookie. There was a lot of talk about 86 clear Jordans at the conference where uh, I, I heard, I think it was Jason was saying, he said, he said, I'll buy these at a hundred thousand all day for tens. 
because there's no more liquid card out there. And, right. and, I, and I know, uh, Dennis, you've had some customers get some, haven't you had some get a nine back lately? Is that right? On, uh, on Jordan? On right? Jordan? Yeah, we had a, a nine and eight five, and I personally got a seven on mine. But Yeah, it's a uh, hot card uh, in any grade. Yeah. So. Um, I like what Brian said too. He said for years, when people asked him what he did for a living, he was embarrassed to tell them. And now he's um, excited to tell, share what's going on in the sports card industry. And for me personally, I, when I told people what I did, a lot of people will say, you can make a living doing that, you know? So yeah. it's totally changed. Even in the last five years, 2015, 16 were really hard. I had to let some people go. And starting in 17, 18, 19, I started reinventing my store and doing more promotions, doing some intentional stuff like that, being intentional about um, having certain promotions. And it's just changed our atmosphere in our store. And now I'm excited to tell people what I do. Yeah. Yeah, he made some really good points. Yeah, I, I I still remember one time years ago, I used to be really big on buying game you not game used tickets, but full tickets from important events. And back back in the late nineties, when McGuire and Sosa were you know in the home run chase, I was buying up quantities of tickets. Like back back then, and I don't think you can do this now, but back then, like you could call the box office, like McGuire would hit a home run. You know, and I'd call them like, hey, are there any standing room only tickets left or whatever, you know, anything I could get. And they're like, well, we've got 200 available. I'm like, I'll take them. <laughs> you know? And so, and so I was, I remember telling, um, I was having dinner with my wife and her uncle was there and, and we were talking about it. He said, wait a minute. He said, you, you, you're telling me you buy tickets to a ball game you're not going to <laughs> and you pay face value for them. And I was like, well, yeah. And he was like, you just not right. <laughs> Cause he was like, why in the world? You know, like, like, and he was just like dumbfounded, like, yep. like boy, th th this boy needs help. And, and you know, and my niece married this guy, you know, it was just like, what are you thinking? <laughs> and, and so, um, yeah, it's, it, it is, it is funny that we, we are beginning to get some respect that we didn't haven't had for, forever you know the the car dealer is always the the guy who's trying to pull a fast one on somebody or whatever you know the the reputation sadly for the typical car dealer has not been great over the years and so and sadly there are some in the industry in the industry's past who have brought that about and so i'm thankful that there's a lot of uh really good guys in the industry a lot of good guys who um i, I could sit here and name a lot of them, but you, you know, guys I'm talking about who, who are good for the industry, who care about the industry. Uh, you're one of them, you know, and, and do a Thank great you. job. Do a great you job. You are too, Joe. Appreciate that. And so we're, uh, we're thankful to have some really good guys in the hobby. And, and, and even, even with our frustrations um, with, with uh, manufacturers and trying to get enough product and trying to source product and, uh, we, we had someone bring up a point about Panini um, during one of the dealer to dealer discussions where somebody was complaining about, well, I don't like the fact that Panini sells some product direct um, straight to consumers. Um, and like, you know, their model should be sell more to stores. And then if stores could get more, um, the prices wouldn't spike so much, you know, there would be more to go around and so forth. And, and another dealer said, well, you know, they make the product, they can do with it what they want to. Yeah. And so that's something we have to realize and that, you know, the law, uh, you know, my, my economics minor, I pull it out every once in a while and the law of supply and demand is in play, you know, when there's not enough supply and there's a lot of demand, the price is going to go up. And so, and, and Panini, has that model in place now where they say, you know, we're going to sell a small percent direct to the public. And then we're going to sell the others to shops and then another percentage to distributors. And, and so the, our end customer doesn't always see all those dynamics going on. Right. Um, but I, 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 go ahead. We're in a 
weird place in history of sports cards too, where we actually have more collectors than we have product. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, like it was it, a great point Brian Gray made uh, from Lee because he he sees this more than we do because he sees it from the manufacturing side, the distribution side, and he knows the level of demand for his product. And he's yeah, I know uh, he he has many many friends in the industry. He has his pulse on the industry, and and he made the point. He said, guys, you know, we and I don't want to misquote him, but he said something like, you know, production could 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 triple or quadruple. And uh, it's still, it's, I don't remember the exact numbers he said, but he made the point like production could ramp up dramatically and products would still sell out everywhere. Things may not go up. I think he made the point, he said, Prism football might not be, not, may not be pre-selling for over a thousand a box, but it would still be 400 a box. Right. You know, and that's even if they, they drastically ramped up the production because they're just so much demand and yep. so it's a great thing i mean you know trust me i've been in the days where i remember the mid 90s and when things were really bad and and as soon as the product came in i'd be like we got to hurry and get rid of this we got to move this before it before it tanks because we had another product to pay for tomorrow and, and you know and we were living off credit cards trying to survive and yeah. so uh, i'll take the you know I, I i would much rather not be able to get enough product than there be so much in the industry so uh, right. And we have a little protection this time around compared to the 90s because, yes, they can create more cards, but they can't get, they can only get so many autographs. They can only get so many game use. So there is a limit on how much they can run their printing presses. Right. And still have uh, content in their boxes. So, so I don't think we'll, even if they increase, um, production some i don't think we'll ever see the production of the 90s i don't think it's possible and still have the assets in the product exactly when, when you've already chose pre when you've chosen on the front end we're going to have this many numbered cards and you're going to hit a numbered card every x number of packs whatever you in or autographs or memorabilia um, because that's what we hear all the time from the manufacturers you know we can't you know they say we can't get enough resources to make more product Right. And I already am hearing, uh, I've heard rumors that with the, so many of the NBA teams being in the bubble, it's not like you could send a bunch of people in to get autographs. Correct. And so that, that, that could possibly, uh, shorten up the supply of autographs for the upcoming 2021 products. And so, uh, we, I don't know if that played into the re some of the reason Panini pushed back releases until, January or it's just the delayed season, whatever. But uh, it'd be I think they also said they didn't have the rookie um, photo shoots or something, both in football and basketball or whatever. They typically get a whole bunch of their autographs for early products. Those were not available this year because of COVID. Right. So yeah, definitely different year in a lot of ways. And uh, yep. it's, had, it's had a, a lot of dynamic impacts on the hobby. And so, um, yeah, with all going on though, I'm pretty impressed that they got out what they did get out. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I know and when 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 your state tells you you have to shut down production for weeks, and I think they went through it a couple times. Yeah. Uh, you know, and and you don't you don't have that secondary printing facility in another state, or you know, uh, a lot of people don't know that Tops and Panini print um, a huge amount of product right there in Texas, and so when they were shut down. You know, there there goes uh, production, and there 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 go and product delays and everything. So yeah, it, it was it was dicey there for a while because we went what it felt like two months or more with no new products. Right. Like that. And yeah. so, so a lot of old product got bought up and dried up and stuff. You're like, oh, that's never gonna sell. And all of a sudden, you're you're chasing trying to replace it because the shelves are bare. So yeah, well, that's why we live in South Dakota. We've been open the whole time, Joe. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I'm jealous of that for sure. So very, very happy for you that you've been able to stay open. So, um, uh, so, so uh, in closing, Dennis, give us as a longtime hobby veteran, what what's your forecast for the coming coming couple of years? I think they're going to be really strong, really exciting. Um, the companies are being innovative. Their cards are looking cool. People 
I was just listening to some customers opening Spectre yesterday. I just love to look at the new Spectre football. And um, I just think we're going to have a good run here uh, as long as a major thing doesn't happen in our country. Yeah. yeah. Like the COVID thing, but actually COVID put the card market on steroids. But but something else like that that could hurt it. Otherwise, I think it's going to be very strong for quite a while, like, like the guys are saying at the conference. Right. And your point about COVID, so nobody misunderstands, because I get where you're coming from, because we talked about it, is that, um, and it wasn't just the card industry, there were other collectible industries too, but but anything because of COVID and the shutdown, so many, it's, it's um, one of the dynamics that came out of it is a whole lot more time was spent at home, a whole lot of people dug out those old collections, a lot of fathers and sons discovered collecting together. And yeah. so that's a beautiful thing. And so, um, and a lot of people had a lot of extra time on their computers to shop. And so uh, it definitely had a huge impact on the, uh, the industry. And so, I mean, I, I know, you know, normally fourth quarter is always our best online season, but we had, we had months uh, in the spring that were just, that, that dwarfed our normal fourth quarter because the volume online was so intense and we were selling selling stuff we haven't sold in years if ever and so yeah. but it was great but what was great about it is that i saw so much of it was going to collectors you know it wasn't just speculators it wasn't just investors you could tell hey this guy's working on his 1983 top set or yeah. you know and 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 i got so many emails from people like hey i've rediscovered collecting i'm having a great time I've re you know I, that word was used over and over we're we're back in collecting we're rediscovering our childhood and so that's that's fun to help people do that yeah i bet you one or two people a day come in our store and say they just started collecting again first yeah. time in first time in your store we just started collecting i dug my cards out i have this eight-year-old kid now that i'm doing it with and it's just blast and i see those people sticking around because they collected you know in the 80s and 90s and that collecting bug never leaves you maybe maybe you got busy with school cars girls right. whatever took you away from your collecting at that point now they're back into it they have some money they're doing it with their kids and just having a blast and and the cards are so much cooler than they were back then to some people. I still like the old stuff myself, but right. Yeah. All right. Well, Dennis, I've really enjoyed it. Why don't you share with all our, again, share with our viewers how they can find you online. Uh, I know you're, you know, any of anybody in the Sioux Falls area can find you, but for those who want to shop with you online around the globe, uh, share all your contacts. Yeah. Our Beckett marketplace um, address, <coughs> excuse me. Our Beckett marketplace address is tpsc.net or the initials at tripleplaysportscards.net, tpsc.net. And then our eBay store is 1967DEW or Triple Play Sports Sioux Falls. Awesome, awesome. Well, it's Thanks been, a lot, Joe. Yeah, it's been a pleasure, and uh, we will definitely have you back on. And, uh, again, I highly encourage all of you out there in the area, uh, support Dennis, great guy, great shop, and uh, they'll do a great job with your PSA cards as well. And uh, if you uh, need to reach him, uh, he's provided all the contact info. And so hope you, all of our viewers will tune in. We'll have more interviews in the near future with some of the other great names in the hobby. So thanks again, Dennis. I know you got plenty of work to get to, but thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Joe. Have a great day. God bless. All right, you too.